I'm super honored to introduce Chuck Cohen. Chuck Cohen is the managing director of Benco Dental. He, he's someone I can call boss, and I absolutely am proud of him. I, I can't work for a better boss. I mean, I know a lot of you probably are out there struggling because you have one office or maybe five offices. You can imagine what the Cohen family is going through, and they've been nothing but supportive. And so Chuck's been a real big fan about trying to get this webinar started so that we can stay in front of our customers. So with that being said, Chuck, you want to take it over? Absolutely, Kay. First of all, we all know at Benco that we all work for Kay. She's a force <laughs> of nature, and we're flattered and honored to have, our, have her on our team. And as we put together these web, this series of webinars to try to deal with the world as it is and as it is becoming, Kay has been integral to putting that together. So thank you, Kay. It's a great You're job welcome. so far. Um, so it's my, it's my distinct privilege to say, first of all, thank you to everyone for being here today. Uh, at Benco, we made our number one goal trying to educate our customers and make some new friends in the process on what life will look like post COVID-19. It will be different. I don't think there's any question about that. Everyone agrees on that. And one of the key pieces, at least for the short term and probably for the long term, is really learning how as practices we can bill for emergency, emergency medically necessary procedures, how we can bill medical insurance for medically necessary procedures, especially as our practices have all gone from elective dentistry to emergency dentistry. So we are truly privileged to have Lori Owens with us today. She's one of the foremost experts on the topics. In the next 60 minutes or 52 minutes, she's gonna give us a quick primer on how to handle this very difficult part of the practice. And everyone will leave this seminar knowing exactly how to bill for medically necessary procedures. Lori, thank you for being with us today. Oh, uh, thank you. Oh, wait. <laughs> Kind of hard to talk with a mask on. I'm sure you all know how that is. That's kind of why I never got to be a dental assistant or hygienist because I can't wear the mask all the time. I think I talk too much. So thank you, Benko. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Deb Dent, for being, being so willing to be able to share information with people. And, and in this time of emergency situations, um, I know all of you can acknowledge the fact that you're only seeing these medically necessary people. And it's important to know that medically necessary treatment is based off of these emergency situations and symptoms. So you wouldn't be saying, okay, um, I know you need a, a, a filling, so we're just going to have you come in and we're going to get that done for you. Everybody knows that that's not an emergency unless it's causing pain or causing infection. That's not going to be a scenario that you can bring a patient in right now. So what we're looking at is in this coronavirus shutdown, what are we allowed to do to get paid for services that we are completing? And like I told Chuck and, and Kay earlier, if I have TRICARE, which is my medical insurance, and I come to your state, and TRICARE has limited exposure on insurance or hospitals that will facilitate as in-network providers, and I come to your house and I bend over with appendicitis, and you take me to a hospital that might be nearby but is not in the TRICARE network, that hospital will be paid as an in-network provider, not because they're so special or because I'm so special, even though I am. It is because of the emergency. So think of it this way with your medical insurance companies. They'll pay you as an in-network provider because of the emergency that you're treating. So think of it that way as we go through what we're going to talk about today. So let's, let's um, as soon as I can get my clicker going. So making sure that you know that what we talk about today between Kay and myself, as well as any kind of the Q&A that comes about, is we are not trying to give you legal advice. We do not own the coding. It's owned by the ADA and the AMA. And we wanna make sure it's very clear that you understand that we're not trying to be your legal team. Every state is gonna be different on what you are allowed to do. Make sure you know the, the legal requirements throughout your state. You can find that probably at the, the .gov um, area for whatever state you're in. So I wanna make sure you understand that we're not trying to tell you for every state this is gonna be applicable. I can tell you for the most part it is, but I cannot tell you for every state. So let's talk about these difficult days in dentistry. So the state recommendations and, and the ADA, 
they don't state you are to be completely closed. And we've actually had this come about. I have an office that's in New York City that they basically saw eight emergency patients because their dental office was closed. That being closed is not being able to see these emergency patients. So what do we do? We send them to the hospital where they're gonna use PPE, where they're gonna use um, that number one, they cannot treat oral cavity emergencies. So what are we really doing to the patients that we treat? We're cutting them off without, without a, a lifeline. So if they do have emergencies, pl please be open. Don't go home and say, oh, this is my playtime or this is my, um, I'm gonna practice golf um, in the house and drive my wife crazy or drive my husband crazy. We have to remember that we are to be open for our patients and others for emergencies. And again, one of the things that we're going to be doing here is we're giving you a triage form. It only, you have to stay the whole course of time, but you'll have a triage form of health history, questions to ask your patient so that you can triage them to say, is this an emergency that the doctor needs to see or treat? So where does that come from? It comes from the team. Um, if the doctors by themselves in their office, it makes it difficult. Please, please, please do not treat patients alone in the practice without anybody else there, ever, ever, ever. I've, I've actually experienced a referring provider who did that, who ended up losing his license and had to leave the state. It is not a good idea in any way, shape, or form. So make sure that you have a dual liability within the practice that if you were to say this did not occur, somebody else could say, I was there and it didn't. So make sure you are covering yourself as well as your practice. So we wanna keep these patients that aren't truly sick as far as having something contagious, we wanna keep them outside of the emergency room. Um, it goes so far, we, I was telling Kay and Chuck that Washington State, we are basically at staying at home until May the 4th. It goes so much that dental offices in Oregon will be closed until June the 15th. What does that say for dentistry? We've got to figure out a way to help the people that have these emergencies. Um, and, and basically, I want to say an emergency to me is something that does not get better without immediate treatment. In other words, could you be sparing their life by treating this or treating this? In other words, if they have an infection and they have a cyst and you have, and it's causing inflammation and you see uh, in a telehealth that you're, you see all of this stuff, guess what? That's an emergency. You might need to drain that. This. You might need to get the infection under control to the ER. They can't do it. What do we want to do? We want to reduce the burden of the ERs. We want to make sure that they're, they're, the triage is done in the dental facility. It, the triage is, is very important. Would you not agree? I hope everybody would agree. Because if it isn't a truly true emergency, number one, we can calm our patients' fears and let them know that this is not something that is, an, is emergent. It is of concern, but it's not an emergency. And so it's our job. It, it's our job. It's not for them to go to the emergency room to do it. And with that, we want to talk about the relaxed prior authorization requirements. I found United Healthcare is really good. Believe it or not, I know people say it all the time, United Healthcare stinks and all that, but their medical is amazing. The medical is amazing. The dental side, I would, not, I would not like them as far as I could throw them, but the, the medical side is amazing. And they've reduced prior authorizations requirements because of this post-acute setting and what we're doing. And it's going till April 30th. And a couple of the codes that I pulled out were in size and drain, which we do a lot of, um, as well as what if you have to take that tooth out and now you have you need to close that sinus with me, maybe collar tape or something like that. Those are the things that we would not have to get pre-authorizations on now. State by state, I wanted, I gave you the area of where you could look at what their insurance regulations are so that you could know, am I doing this above board? 
uh, and everything that I'm talking about needs to be above board. You need to be able to, to write your notes as if you were speaking them in court. Um, don't, don't try to say, well, I'm just going to make it seem a little more than it is because that's never going to be good. Always make sure that you're being honest. Let's talk about the symptoms because when we do exams and when we do radiographs, and this is whether they're emergency or not, it is all symptom based. So I gave you some of the ones that I come up with a lot. And if you'll notice, predominantly they're in the R series. They all start with the letter R, except for infection. Infection being a K-12 too. But these are all symptoms uh, of things that we address within, uh, within our practices. I know somebody said, well, what about halitosis? Really? Well, do you know when somebody has an infection in their oral cavity, it can come across as if they have halitosis? So I get that we're just, you think, oh, we're trying to jump the gun. Well, I'm going by what the symptom the patient tells you. And again, is this all come, do you come up with this in triage? Yes. If I said, Kay, what are your symptoms? Tell me, tell me what would make you want to be seen right away. You could probably pick one of these. You could probably say, I, right? Kay? <laughs> Swelling, pain. <laughs> exactly. You could come up with, maybe you have dry mouth. You know, edema is swelling. It's, it's like, um, uh, I want to say, I'm, it's not water, but it's liquid um, to where if you touch it and it comes back and it turns white, that's edema. Those are all things that we can be able to see. And again, we're talking about edema unspecified. We're not trying to say that it's something other than what the patient tells us. So we never ever want to go beyond what the patient says. You'll notice in R52 is pain, but R6884 is jaw pain. Again, going back to what the patient says. If K says I have jaw pain, then what would I use? I would use R6884. But if K called and said, hey, you know what? I am just in pain. I'm not gonna use R6884 because that's not what she said. I would use R52 because it's still denoting pain. So hopefully you can see the difference in what we're gonna be coming up against with other patients coming in once our practices get back up. What if they come up with fever? What if they come up with cough? Would those be all, all reasons why we can actually do a screening for COVID? Those are all things that are important for you to know now because believe it or not, you might actually have to screen some patients. And that's where Benko is going to come into play and talk to you about what products they have for you to be able to screen these patients so you can limit exposure for the rest of your patients. And if you're not going to be on top of it, you're going to be under it. So figuring out what works best for your practice, just knowing that you have the availability of using these symptom-based diagnosis. This is not what the doctor is saying. This is what the patient is saying, okay? So let's talk about the definition of medical emergency for dentistry. Is there a gum abscess? Is there, a pu we talked earlier today when I was talking to Leah about pupil access or abscess. How about swelling or bleeding? Broken teeth that are causing pain. So yes, your patient could have fractured off a cusp, but if it's not causing pain, it's not emergent. If it is causing pain, it is emergent. How about pain on biting that's uh, related to an infection or a cracked tooth? Inflammation cause, you'll notice there's a little theme here called pain. So inflammation causing pain around wisdom teeth or trauma due to an accident. Those are all symptoms as far as why you would need to treat that patient as a medical emergency for dentistry. So this is different than what the ADA put out as a guideline because this is medically related. Um, how about let's talk about the symptoms or of infection or cellulitis, which is another word for infection. Pain or tenderness, <clears throat> excuse me, in the area. You've got redness or inflammation of your skin. 
So if, the, if you ask the patient, if you, if you were to put your hand on it, would you say it's hot to touch? Those are all the things that we've asked over the phone. How about a skin sore or rash that grows quickly? You know, we all bite our cheek. Okay, what if, what if that bite on your cheek is all of a sudden getting worse, turning red, and, and making you seem like you have a bad taste in your mouth? How about an abscess with pus? Tight, glossy, swollen skin. How about a fever? If you, now remember, the fever for COVID is different than a fever for an abscess or infection. It's not usually gonna get up to the high ranks. It's, uh, COVID is like over 102 is what they're looking for. Um, a, a fever with an oral infection is gonna get to be about 100, maybe 101. It's not gonna get to that huge extent of a COVID fever. Uh, immediate implant placement is not usually payable as an emergent treatment. So if you have a doctor that says, oh, I place immediate implants, in this circumstance of what we're seeing in medically for our patients, please don't let them place an implant because there, there is like a good likelihood that it's not going to be covered because it's not part of the emergency. Taking the tooth out, uh, doing a bone graft and doing a membrane, yes. But placing an implant is not what the treatment is for the emergency. So here's what it would look like. We've got an emergency extraction bone graft membrane due to an infection and inflammation. Let's talk about our diagnosis codes and basically our story. Our story for this patient is cellulitis infection is my first code. My second code is minimal atrophy maxilla. Now again, we're looking at specifically tooth number 12, as you can see on line three. You'll see it says the D7210 with the specific tooth number. So we're talking about the maxillary arch. And then R22 because of the inflammation. So how it was coded, if you notice that my highest fee is on top, in dentistry, we code it as we do it. Right, Kay? Right. So in other words, my exam that's on the bottom on line four would be on top. Would that be a good payout at the highest percentage? No. I want the, high, the first line is going to get your highest percentage reimbursement. So make sure your highest fee is on top. Interesting. Hey, do you see in 24C of this claim, do you see what I have in there? There's a Y. And there's a Y in there because it's denoting the fact that this was an emergency. EMG stands for emergency. So this claim will tell the insurance company this service was provided because there was an emergency. So again, my first code is going to be for a bone graft. And if you can see the CPT legend below, it equals the D7953. So going down to line number two, 15574 is equivalent to our 4266. So for your resorbable membrane. Again, the 41899 to the 7210 and the 99202 to the D0140. I want to take a second just to talk about the modifiers that are on here. So you see modifier 52, because the bone grafting code consists of taking the bone, we used granulated bone. So what we did was we used modifier 52 to tell them we didn't do the whole code. There was part of the code that wasn't completed. So that's what the 52 tells them. And if you look on the 99202 number on line four, the modifier 25 tells them this exam was done separate. Everybody in dentistry does not do, come into your senior patient and say, yep, number 12 needs to come out and start giving anesthetic. They always want to see if when I take out 12, is that going to compromise 13 and 14? Is it going to compromise 11? What's it going to do? If you don't use the modifier 25, it will not get paid. It will be considered as part of your treatment. So that's why modifier 25 is important to use on your exams when you're doing your same day procedures. 
So we're again, please put in, in the chat feature what questions you might have and we can go over it after this section. Yes, Kay. We do have tons of questions. So I didn't know what was going to be a strong point. I mean, this is very, this is a, this is a lot of great information. So, um, so let, I'll let you finish and then you tell me when you're ready for the questions. Questions now, that way uh, I don't want to leave from this screen if people have questions about it that I could point it out. Yeah, okay, so um, let's go to Donna. Donna, you want to pop up some of your questions and let's go from there? Sure, absolutely. Can you all hear me? Absolutely. Okay, so Lori, um, before we learn how to bill for the treatment, are dentists obligated to have to perform or to provide treatment to patients in need of urgent care? It is not like we're playing golf, but I cannot get the staff to come in to treat these few urgent cases. He, he's got to find somebody or be able to send them to somewhere. I mean, that, that is, you're going to lose patients. They're, they're going to say they abandoned me in time of need. They're not going to come back. So there is, there is an abandonment clause, I think, that is something in the, health, the, the Patient's Health Act, right? And I, I do think that Laura's 100% right. Um, it doesn't, I mean, it's, as long as someone goes in the office with them and, you know, some of these procedures, maybe they can't do all the procedures without an assistant, but, you know, seeing the patient to make sure that even if they refer the patient out, it's better than saying, yeah, I'm not going to come in. I'm not going to see you. I, I just think that's, that's just not a good move on any of our, of anyone's part. I think that we need to take care of our patients. I, you know, I understand if you can't find staff, I know that they have connections within their their own patient or their doctor base, find somebody who does. And, yeah. be able, you know, and honestly, if I were the dentist, I would say, let me get you to them and I'm going to come so that I can be there with you so that you're not just leaving it all up to chance. And I would actually be the one calling that dentist to say, I have an emergency patient and I don't have enough staff to treat them. Thank you. That's a great, I mean, that is a good question, but take care of your patients. I mean, do everything you can. And like she said, maybe even if you refer them out. So Donna, you have one more? I do. Um, if you have a Medicare participant that has an emergency, how would you build Medicare if you have previously opted out? You can't. There, there's no way. So if you are an opt out provider, there's and not to mention the fact that they're, they're not going to pay for it anyway. Um, you just, you can't bill them. Um, I would not want a Medicare provider or patient um, to, to even have any glimmer of hope because there's, they won't even accept your claim. So it, it's not it's not really even something I have to think about. I, you cannot build them. So so that wasn't waived during the COVID nineteen, like the president talked about. That was one that wasn't waived. Is that what you're telling me? Correct. Okay. Because and Lori, one 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 quick question. I'm sorry, but where do we get a medical claim form if we only have dental forms? And then I'll pause. Oh, you have to. Amazon has them. Can they can be there in two days? Elizabeth, you have anything? Uh, yes, um, I, I've got a doctor that's asking a question. Is this just for extractions or can this be for endo um, also to save the tooth? It is, and we're going to, we have an endo scenario too. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I, Thank I'm you. good. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Lauren. Okay, so let's talk about this scenario. We've got a 19 year old male with a bad taste in his mouth and visible and visible. In other words, the doctor can see through telehealth, he's got external inflammation on the upper right. The emergency treatment is to do a cone beam, extraction, bone graft membrane, and a sinus closure. So let's think, what procedures and diagnosis codes would we use? Kay, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah, what, don't put me <laughs> What would be your exam, the reason to do an exam in office based off of the symptoms? Let's see. So um, inflammation. Because he's, inflammation. He's inflammation. Absolutely. So let's look at what the scenario could look like. My diagnosis codes are above. We're going to look at a partial loss of teeth due to other, that other being the abscess or infection and the inflammation and the pain. We're also doing the bone graft because of the atrophy. So those are the codes. And notice to the left my ICD pointer, A, B, C, D, E. Now let's go over to the procedure codes. 
we're doing a 41899, which equals our D7210. And do you see on the right, the pointer says A is my primary, B is my secondary, and C and D are my supporting documentation. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip this around. D, patient calls with pain and inflammation, right? Pain and inflammation. We find the doctor sees an abscess. And because of that, the patient's losing their tooth. So making sense both ways is very important. We're taking the tooth out because of an infection, which had inflammation and pain. Both ways, it will make sense. Yeah. But why are we doing the CBCT? The 70486 in medical equals the D0367 in dental. <clears throat> We're doing the cone beam because of the inflammation and the pain. So making sense of what we're doing primary, going on to what the comorbidities are as far as what the treatment necessity is. So for the bone graft, the 21210 equals that D7953. We're now saying that we have atrophy. Now we took the tooth out to create the atrophy, but medical says that's not the point. They want to know what the extent of the bone graft that you're doing is. If it's minimal, if it's moderate, if it's severe. And on this code, we said there was minimal atrophy. So again, look at my primary is E. That minimal atrophy was caused by the infection, which had pain and inflammation. So again, all of the codes are going to make sense. Why they do all we kind of go together, don't they? They, they just kind of like, it, I mean, the way you have it laid out is so easy. I have a quick question though. One of the doctors want to know, and I know, I know the answer to this because you've given it to me. Do they have to be a provider of the medical insurance in order to be able to do this? So do you want to answer that? So I, I, in, in the practice I was at, uh, we were never an in-network provider with any insurance. So, so it, it, again, it goes back to, uh, are you credentialed with cash, cash.org, and cash is one where you validate your license, you validate your malpractice, you validate your DEA. That's saying, I'm do these are the services that I'm doing, whether it be general dentistry, oral surgery, endodontic, you can list them all as subspecialties. So making sure that is accurate. And then there's something that you can call cash and say, I want to open my file up to medical and dental. Good information. Open that up to the medical side and the dental side. And that's how they will verify if, you are, if your license is valid, if you're able to do what you're stating that you did in your coding. So that's where I start first. Get that done. Make sure, and if you say, I already have a cash account, have you attested to it? In other words, have you said everything is correct? Everything is valid. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's, and you know, that's a good one because they actually should be updating that regularly. I mean, that is the best thing anyone can do. So now, I, now putting that together and attaching that to medical is really good. And the other question they said is that when you look at this scenario, the question is, is that do they need to submit this to medical or, or dental first? Like if the patient well, has both. Is. If you have an infection that if your doctor doesn't treat could kill them, where would you send that? Is a that medical. a dental issue or a medical issue? So we have to rethink it. Medical already has the answer. They give us the specific codes. Notice atrophy maxilla. Who else can use that code but in dentistry? Yeah. We're the only ones that can use that. So why we're not taking advantage of something that's already been laid out by us by medical insurance. In other words, I, I go back to, I would rather bill medical. What's the worst thing they can say, Kay? Uh, no, <laughs> no, or, or, or go back to, to, to uh, dental, but medical is going to pay so much better. Medical is going to pay for the CTC scans. They're going to pay. We're not so talking about sending your your fee schedule amount we're talking about sending your ucr you your standard always, fee your standard fee not not your ppo fee but your standard fee should always be sent and again you did tell me earlier you shouldn't go up just because you're billing to medical i loved how you said that laura you should always stick to what you charge the only difference that you're doing here is you're changing the codes 
Yes, be, you know, my cousin, so I'm from Hawaii, my cousin sent me pictures in during the hurricane, they were charging $24.99 for a case of $2.99 water. Say it again, my, I'm sorry. They, they were charging $24.99 for a case of $2.99 water. Oh my gosh, you know, that's just, that's just terrible. I think Chuck could probably chime in on that. I know that that that's going on a lot and we, we try our best not to get in, you know, just to keep it good for our client. You, there you go. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. We do not do price gouging at Benco. Now there are times when we need to raise our prices because our vendors raise the price to us, but we do not do price gouging. That's just not the way to do business. Not the way, not the way to make friends and influence people. And I don't so think you can do, do that in medical billing either. If, absolutely. If not, this is not a, because of, this is a, a, they're laxing, the rules that we, oh, I'm gonna take advantage of that. I'm gonna get paid $1,000 for a bone graft when I usually only charge 500. Now, I'm, I'm saying that there, there are a lot of fees that should be changed. I think you should contact your Benco rep for a fee analysis, but this is not the time to do it. Your fee should be your fee should be your fee, period, and end a sentence. You should get paid for what you're doing. So I'm sorry, um, they just have tons of questions. So can we take three more questions and then we'll move on? I know we have to say in our hour, but um, I really want to make sure we, you know, address some of these questions. So Elizabeth, do you want to go? Yes, ma'am. I was trying to, to pull up a couple of questions. Uh, Laurie, one of the things they wanted to know was how to spell cash. And if I'm not mistaken, it's C-A-Q-H. Correct. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Um, so can any dentist bill through medical or is it only oral surgeons? Any dentist. Any dentist. Okay. So I worked for a periodontal practice um, for, I was the medical biller for 15 years. And if I told you all the, all the much, how much money we were able to obtain for medical, most people would be shocked half to death. Okay. Uh, you know what? You shocked me in what, you know, in my presentations that, you know, I made you prove to me what you could get from your, <laughs> um, I can't wait. She will be going over that later in this presentation. So I want her to show you guys. I mean, if you're, a, if you own a dental office, this is something that you should be doing. I'm going to say it again. This is where we're headed. I can't wait to the day that dental insurance doesn't exist. I'm, I, I'm, I'm excited about that. And I hope you are too, because we have to fight these PPOs and these DMOs for what we call a fair fee. And I, you know, it's just, it's gotta go away. I, I really feel like this is where we're headed. I believe it too. Okay, my next one is, can we bill medical for telehealth exam only and then yes. refer the patient to the specialist for endo or extraction or whatever yes. needs to be done? Well, let me go back here to this claim. So do you see where it says place of service in B? So 24B, you would place, instead of the 11, you would put 02, because the place of service would be telehealth. Everyone see that? It's right there um, underneath the middle section. So it says B, 24, place of service. Yes, place of service would be 02 for your telehealth. Your procedure code would be dependent upon time. And you can always email me. I can get you the times either an established patient or an exist or a new patient. So depending upon the, the, the patient base of what you're looking for, the way it's gonna tell the insurance company it's telehealth is the place of service. Got it, thank you. Perfect. Okay, uh, another one is, do you guys have cheat sheets available to match up these dental codes with medical codes to make it easier to bill? So I will say this, Laura has given um, all of the Benco reps an amazing copy. So at the end, we will go over how you can receive that from your Benco representative. And if you don't have a Benco representative, how, you, how we at Benco can make sure you get a copy. She is literally, I have it right here. I'm gonna show it, I'll show my sheet sheet. She has it on both sides. Look at this nice laminate copy that she, and these are pretty much what covers everything in a dental office. So, you know, she's done an amazing job in helping offices um, and make it, making it easy. I mean, Laura, you've just made it easy. That's all I can say. So let's keep going. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, are you talking to BK? No, but I think we need to keep going because we have to cover a lot of information. So we, if, again, if we don't get to all of the questions, we, we will make sure that we get them to Laura. And I know Laura will absolutely respond to them. So um, if, you, if you have a question out there that we haven't answered, 
don't worry. We will make sure your questions get answered. We just want to kind of keep it going because we have a lot of material to cover in this hour. I talk a lot. So let's we talk, talk a lot. <laughs> the symptoms of incise and drain. And again, I tried to keep it where we live and what we do and see. So incise and drain, you're looking for swelling, inflammation, pain, redness, raised or rounded skin, warm to touch as well as drainage or pus. And again, I wouldn't ask a patient, hey, do you have pus coming out of your mouth? Because they don't even know what it is. But you could ask if there's something draining or they feel like something's draining within the oral cavity. And this is kind of how it looks on an excise and drain. So looking at pain, infection, and inflammation. Um, you can notice that, again, what's, the, what's on my first line? My highest fee. Even though we might have done the exam first, the highest fee is always on top. And the reason is, is you'll get paid. So say, for instance, they have a 90% payout. You'll get 90% on the first line. They will reduce it for each additional line. So the second line might be paid at 80%. So you want to make sure you get paid the most on your highest fee. So again, let's look at our codes. You've got K-12-2 for that infection, pain, as well as the inflammation. Again, 24C, put a Y. The difference is, if it's not an emergency, you leave it blank. They only want the Y in there if it is an emergency. So if it's not an emergency, you leave that 24C blank. If it is an emergency, make sure to put the Y. And for this excise and drain, my first is patient has an infection and pain and inflammation. Let's flip it around. Patient called with inflammation and pain, doctor found an infection. So again, it should make sense both ways. It shouldn't be a one-sided thing. And I gave the CPT or the procedure code equivalent, the 10061 is equivalent to our D7520 or the 7521. The 99212 is equivalent to our D0140. This is for an established patient. Again, I don't know if you, if you were like me, but I loved it when people would call and say, what, how, do, how come I have to pay a fee? The doctor was in there for five minutes. I have a great answer for you. What's that? I'm so glad I only charged you the five minute fee. My 10 minute fee is $152. My 15 minute fee is $199. Would you like me to check on the time? <laughs> I'm good with my $74 fee. So again, it's based on time and medical. So why can it not be based on time and dentistry? It's basically health. So what do you have to review to get their health? So let's go a little further. Let's talk about emergency trauma. I look at it as accident or incident. So Kay, say for instance, your, your granddaughter headbutts you and you lose a couple teeth. Is that an accident or an incident? Because are you gonna go to the hospital for it? Probably not. No. But you'll head to your dentist. Why should we treat that any different then if somebody, um, I, had, I had one of my students, they had a patient who walked into a lamppost oh. and lost their teeth. So again, that, the accident was, was the unintentional, and then you've got the incident, which is that baby just pitching a fit. So make, we're going to talk about thinking about accident versus incident, but we're looking at auto accidents, accidentally struck by somebody intentionally struck by someone, um, fall off of a bicycle, scooter, or skates, fall while walking. Okay, now my daughter can, can walk and fall at the same time. So, <laughs> I have again. a coach that does that well. <laughs> <clears throat> and then what about a slip, trip, or fall in, in your home? That's, you are in your house all the time. Do you, what about injury during roughhouse playing with your children? Um, it's bound to happen. You might get a knee to the mouth. So there's so much more. So we need to look at these accidents. And, and this is beyond our COVID um, seclusion thing. This could happen at any time. Making sure we know, hey, I have an option to help you through your medical. Here's what I need. 
So I gave you a scenario where I gave, here's the accident form and Kay, I'll email this to you so that if you have people that don't have an accident form, mine has stood up with Wisconsin, Wisconsin Physician Services um, because they wanted proof that my patient was riding her bicycle and hit a rock and fell face forward on the pavement. So literally she didn't go to the hospital. She came right up to our practice and we had to take care of that. We filled out this accident form and it stood up with the insurance company. So thinking about with your team, what would constitute an accident? What would constitute an incident? Now remember within that it can be intentional or unintentional. So we've actually had people that had intentional. Um, I had a, a wife whose husband struck her and knocked her tooth out. Is that intentional or unintentional? So we have to think about what are we looking for? This should be something a practice determines. What is it the doctor deems as an accident? What is it the doctor deems as an incident? Because both of them are covered under trauma. So let's look at it a little bit differently. So again, what are we looking at here? We've got a patient who needed a reimplantation of an avulsed tooth from a fall off of a bicycle. So look how specific these codes are. Dislocation, dislocated tooth, okay? Would you think that's appropriate? Yes. How about fall from bicycle? They were the driver, non-collision, non-traffic. Appropriate? Yeah, I mean, they were the driver of a bicycle, non-collision, non-crash. Non right. And how about this, pain? pain that yeah. would be the first thing. Patient has pain, right? Definitely. That's why we're doing that. All this treatment is because of this trauma. And if you look right above, I put up here in 14, box number 14, the date of the accident and the qualifier 431, which means accident. So it, it can only mean one or two things, accident or illness or pregnancy. I don't think a little kid's gonna have pregnancy, right? And so let's look at the CPT legend or the procedure code legend, how it equivalates to us in dentistry. So the 21085 is equal to our D7880. A lot of times when they put that tooth back in, they need to make that splint so that it protects and helps it heal so that way they're not re-injuring that area. The 40830 is equal to our D7910. And the 70355 is equal to our 0330 or our PANO. Hey, I didn't put the D in front of the 7270, sorry. Um, but again, what are we looking for? We're looking for what we were gonna get covered in medical. Notice again, what's on my top line? The most expensive. Most expensive fee. Um, so what am I saying? I'm going to say this patient has a dislocated tooth due to falling off their bicycle with pain. Does it make sense? It does. Patient calls, flip it around. Patient called your office in pain because they fell off their bike and dislocated their tooth. It, it makes sense both ways. So when I tell myself a story as I code things, I want to make sure that it's making sense to whoever's reading my claim. Because when I send a medical claim, I don't send anything else, Kay. I don't send the extra. There's no narrative. This is the narrative, correct? This is the diagnostic code, which is a narrative. Exactly. The narrative is in how I'm coding it. What's my primary? What's my secondary? And, and what's my, you're only allowed four diagnosis codes per service. So you're not talking about filling it out A to L. You're looking at four per service. So I hope that helps people get a little thought process back to your childhood injuries that you guys see and how it might be covered by medical. So let's look one, at it. One question real fast, Laura. So why is the 250 above the 400? Oh, the only reason is because that the, the, the reimplantation more than likely is not covered. Oh, got it, okay. No, I don't, I want, I want it sequenced in what I think is going to get covered. And if my, if that bottom one, the 7270 is not covered, I'm not going to have to worry about it because I'm going to get paid on those higher levels. Got it. Okay. Thank you. So if I was doing a 7210, I'll probably put it last. Yeah. Got it. Okay. 
And it so really is looking, like it's almost like speaking a different language. If you if you yeah, think about it, it's like Spanish or English, right? It's like that's what it sounds it like to me. But I think if people go back and look at it and say, "What's the story? Yeah. Tell me the story." So here's a story. We've got a 22 year old female who fell off the toilet, striking the tub after she fainted. Patient contacted the office through telehealth. External inflammation on maxillary and mandible anterior. Fractured dentition. Okay, can I ask you one thing? Have I said tooth in any of this? No. But have I still given you the areas of concern? Yes, you have. So please, please, please think your chart notes. Don't say tooth, tooth, teeth, teeth, teeth. Talk about the areas. You can still give the areas of location, 8, 9, 24, 25, but don't focus on teeth. Focus on the structure of the arch, reconstructing. That's going to be important in any note. And I'm not talking about, oh, we have to do this for medical. If I sent the same note to dentistry, they'd understand everything I just said. It is not one way for dentistry and one way for medical. Do all your notes the same way and it comes through in, for your benefit. So let's go further. So now we have external inflammation on maxillary and mandible anterior with that fractured dentition. We've got emergency treatment, which is a cone beam, possible extraction of eight and nine with a bone graft membrane and root canal therapy on 2425, crowns on 2425 with future implants to be placed on eight and nine to facilitate reconstruction of the mandible, or the maxilla, sorry. So what procedures and diagnosis codes would we use? And I did, I'm not gonna leave you in the dark. So let's look at our, our diagnosis codes first. We're gonna talk about the partial loss of teeth due to trauma. Would you say that's appropriate? Absolutely. But what about a fracture of a tooth due to trauma? Appropriate? I think so. Now, how about this, Kay? Fall from or off toilet with subsequent striking against object. Appropriate? Yeah. This is a true patient, by the way. This was one of my patients. As well as fainting. Appropriate? Yes. And how about the, the cause they ended up with minimal atrophy on the maxilla? So what did we do procedure-wise? We did a 7210 of eight and nine. We did a cone beam of the 0367. And let's look, go back to that surgical extraction. What's my primary? We have a partial loss of teeth. Because there's a fractured tooth from falling off the toilet after they fainted. Flip it around, patient fainted, fell off the toilet, fractured their tooth, and now they have a loss of that tooth. Make sense both ways? It does. So again, saying this stuff back to yourself will help you understand. Am I making sense? Does it, what if I said, okay, we have a patient who fractured their tooth and falling off the toilet and they have a partial loss of teeth. If my primary is a fracture of the tooth, that's not what the treatment was. So it's not gonna make sense. Now, if we flip, it, flip that around and we said a, a partial loss of teeth, because of a fall from a toilet with a fractured tooth. That doesn't make sense either because the treatment is last when it should be first. So let me ask you a quick question. Um, so it looks like some of these codes may be for the, or the old surgeon. So let's just simplify it and let's just say that it's not a surgical extraction. We can still, um, we're, I mean, uh, there's some questions that are saying that. Say for instance, you did a root, a root tip, or you did a simple extraction. That still doesn't negate the fact that the tooth had to come out and you had to do something else to it. So it still would be a, a general dentist could still do this. Because I mean, that, I think they're thinking that, well, this seems like it's going to be oral, yeah, sur I, oral I surgeon. Zero one or a D7, D140. Absolutely. Got so it. it just depends on what type of procedure was needed. Okay. If it was just root tip, then do it as a root tip. Got Again, it. you're not. You, if you are, your doctor is capable in providing these services, then they are able to build these services because the licensure for a general dentist is head and neck. That's correct. So would it be appropriate for them to provide these services? Now, again, please don't watch YouTube videos to figure out 
how to do this. <laughs> no. Training, right? <clears throat> I'm certainly not one. If you don't know how to do it, get them to somebody who does. Yeah. If you're not comfortable doing it, get them to somebody who does. But we also can figure out how to bill it. I actually had a flight attendant who fell, and believe it or not, their medical followed them, Kay, from our office taking out eight and nine to endo for 2425 to ortho because the arch was now deformed back to us for um, implants and her general dentist for crowns. So and this we was all covered under medical. All under medical because it wasn't the fact of what we were doing. It was the fact of the, the, the trauma had to go these different places to get services done. Got it. So we've got to figure out that this is all under our able bodies of what we can do. So again, what are we looking endo-wise? We've got a D3310, which equivalates in medical for a 41806, removing the foreign body hard tissue. You're going into the hard tissue to remove that foreign body that's within the pole, correct? Yeah. People tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. No, you're right. <laughs> we just need to get back to thinking, what services are we doing that should be a, a medical nece necessity? And in this time of where we're at, everything you're doing it should be medically necessary. Perfect. So let's go on. Let's talk about endo. So the symptoms of endo infection, we're looking at pain. And I didn't know this. They came up with crown discoloration that crown discoloration can denote infection. How about abscess and or a fistula? Internal root resorption. Do you know there's a code for root resorption? There's a specific code. Increased tooth mobility, fever, bad taste, or halitosis. So again, endo, a lot of endodontists say, oh, it doesn't apply to me. And I say, why not? Yeah. One, you're doing cone beams, and you're doing cone beams because patients in pain why would that not apply to you? So yeah. how does that look? So your endo emergency diagnosis. I gave you, I wanted to give you more than just one. So you've got your pathological resorption, your necro necrotic pulp, pulp degeneration, abnormal hard tissue formation in the pulp, acute apical periodontitis of the pupil region or origin. So remember, it's periodontitis within that pulp. So again, Dennis, that's for you to determine. We can only code it with what you say, as well as your, um, your cyst or your infection and pain. The two procedure codes that I would always use would be, is it a lesion removal or did you have to go through the hard tissue to get to that foreign body? Those are the only two codes you'd use in endo. So I thought it was pretty cool. I found this cool picture of endo and kind of how it goes into, now it might be decay. Look how simple, I mean, diagnostic code, procedure code. And it, this is, any general dentist can use this or Absolutely. any endodontist can use this, very simple. Very simple. And again, your notes talking about the severity of the infection, the severity of the fistula, um, the severity of what the patient's experiencing. It's, that's what it's going to come back to. If you're going to write your note like you text message, it's not going to work. You need to make sure you're clear, concise. I'm not saying you have to have a four-page novel. I'm saying you just need to be clear, concise. Patient contacted the office in severe pain. On a scale of one to 10, they say their highest has been a six. Making sure we're clear on what we're talking about, that this is an emergency without dentistry. So here's how it's going to look on your claim form. We're talking about that same kind of uh, a thing. We're talking about the 41806, doing an endo on tooth number 20, as well as the pano. Should you not get paid for a pano or a, a cone beam? I mean, that's to me like a no-brainer. I actually have offices charging $1,500 for a cone beam. I don't recommend it. So if anybody says, Lori said charge $1,500, no, 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 no. <laughs> I am saying that a lot of providers have reduced their cone beam fee because they feel like I'm going to have to write it off anyway. And they're not billing medical because this has infection. 
this has pain. Those are two codes that all of the all of the radiology experts that work with our medical insurances are applicable to why you want to do the cone beam. So a, a question that came up was that if, a, if this patient that you're showing right now has dental and medical, would your first um, filing yep. go to medical? Yep. As long, you know, and I would say this again, as long as you followed what she said as far as when they called in, writing it down, really pinpointing exactly. whether it was an infection and pain. So again, guys, if it's um, a patient that has dental insurance, she's saying go medical with so your standard the fees. People ask all the time is what about timely filing? You can still prove timely filing to medical. It's still applicable. Dental will accept it as a filing within the time limits. So don't think that you'll run out of time limits with timely filing because you're billing to medical. It's still applicable. Got it. Yeah, I don't want you, don't be scared away because their goal is to get you not to bill because if they can get you not to bill, then they don't have to pay. I know we're kind of getting close to the end, so I really want to make sure that we, we have to wrap it up. Here we've got a 20 year, 29 year old male with severe pain, lower left, again, telehealth. Um, visible external on the lower left, emergency treatment, cone beam, root canal therapy. Let's look at those codes. Abscess, cellulitis, apical, periodontitis, a pupil, and pain. Again, we're removing the heart foreign body, going into the heart tissue, and replacing that crown on top. So I hope this makes sense to everybody. Um, if not, please, we'll be at the end. I'll give you some information of how to get to me or Kay, and we'll be able to make sure you understand. So I did, go ahead. Go ahead. I thought, go ahead, no, go ahead. Okay, so I wanted to give you what's gonna be on your triage sheet. These are questions you need to ask your patient. So anybody who's attending this webinar, uh, they will be emailing you the triage sheet that has lots of things, it has health history, it has the triage questions. And then you need to make sure your doctor says, okay, well, if they answer this, Okay, on a scale of zero to 10, what do most people who are in pain say? It's an 11, it's what they always say. So where does that fall? Where does a doctor wanna see them? If they say it's a one and a half, the doctor might say, that's a patient I wanna watch. Does that make sense? So yeah. again, the questions, are you taking medication to relieve the pain? What medication and what dosage? And again, if this can all be done before the doctor actually sees the patient, it's triage. Is this keeping them out of the emergency room so that we can be able to do our job in dentistry? I gave you a few more questions. Um, one important one is number 14. Has your physician required you to take an antibiotic prior to dental treatment? Because if they don't pre-med, you have them come in, you can't do anything, right? Yeah. It's a waste of time. So make sure you're asking the right question because some people don't understand. If I say to you, do you have to pre-medicate? They don't understand what that is. Say it a little clearer. Does your physician require you to take an antibiotic prior to dental treatment? It makes it clearer. They understand it a lot more. So I wanted to get to these EOBs. I thought these were important. This is I the fun part. I love this, Laura. This is my exciting part. I want you all to see what other people are getting. These are not even people I bill for. I do bill for four offices myself. So this is a, a, a 70486 being that cone beam and an exam. And notice of the 433 they billed, they applied $25 as the copayment. In other words, you go visit your doctor, you have a copay. That's what that $25 is. And they're paying this provider $296.96. Now, this is beyond your dental. So I haven't used an exam and I haven't used any x-rays, but this patient still got paid on the medical side. So, and I do want to say this, we, we, we are running over a little bit. I apologize, but this is such good information. So, um, so I, I, am, I do want to make sure that our viewers that are watching, we had a little late start. So hopefully that'll make up for this, so go ahead. Okay, so this is an orthotic as well as um, a cone beam. This is one of the offices I told you charges $1,500 for the cone beam. But notice they allowed $733.02. So of that, they allowed that much. 
The orthotic is that splint that's holding those teeth in place. Of their 5,000, notice they allowed 4,230. So again, I want you to see the difference in what's billed and what gets paid on. Um, again, you have an exam, but do you know why this exam was paid at zero? Do you wanna know why? why? No modifier. They didn't no, use the modifier for the same day service. And so they didn't get paid on that exam. Had they used that modifier, they would have gotten paid on it. This is just so, I mean, this is so much money that, I mean, do you know how much this could impact a practice? A practice that's struggling um, or not even that. Let's go back and say, do you know how much this could impact a patient's life? Mm -hmm. If we really took the time to understand this, because this is where we're headed, it's going to make a big difference in your practice. And more than anything, it's going to make a huge difference for your patients that you really want to take care of. So um, yeah. this is amazing. So here's another cone beam that was done at 320, allowed at 275 and paid. So again, this was a cone beam as well as a tori removal. So if you have a patient that has pain due to tori, notice they paid $1,735.43. If you would have gotten that payment in dentistry, you would have been done for the year, right? And so the goal is, if it's medical in nature, let's go medical. If it's dental in nature, in other words, you have one caries lesion and it's not even enough for anesthetic, um, I go dental because I don't have a reason of why they need one caries lesion removed. How about this? This is an exam and a bell scope paid 100%. Wow. This one is for, um, uh, I forgot, an office visit. So 250 was the total. They paid it at um, 105.60 minus that $18 copay. This one I wanted you to see, Kay, because do you see where I circled Medicare PPO? Yes. This is not dental, because look at the procedure code, 99202. So your Medicare PPO, as long as you get an ABN form, you can get paid on it. But I can't go into that now, but no. I want you to see that there is a difference and you can get paid even though you're not in network. And really quickly, just one question. If they don't have a CVCT, I mean, definitely, you know, this is a great way to get one in their office. I think it's going to be somewhere that we're going to need that. But can they do the same thing for with a PANO? Yes, it's a 70355. Okay, so if you don't have a CVCT, a CVCT, you need to eventually get one. However, and we'll help you figure out how to get that paid for. How about, how about a PA? 70300. There's still a medical code for a PA. Wow. There's still a medical code. It just means why. You just have to have your why. Listen, so, I'm super excited. If you ever ask me, is this covered? The first thing I'm going to say is why. So I know we have a lot of questions and I know, is this the last slide? I'm not sure. No, the, so I, if you want to do a demo, our, our cloud-based medical billing software is designed for dentistry. You can put your dental code in there. It will tell you what it crosses to in medical and give you hints on diagnosis code. So I just want to make sure it's free. You just can look at it and see if it's something that you want to do. But here's the last slide, Kay. So okay. I wanted to make sure you knew that, that there are webinars on demand at devdent.com as well as benco.com. So make sure they're on demand webinars. And if we have downtime, why not go the extra mile? Why yeah. not? Something new. We also have a private Facebook group, Medical Billing for Dental Practices, hyphen Imagine Billing. It is only for questions. Um, you will never get sold anything on that group. If you if you try to sell something, I might delete you. It's, <laughs> so not for it, them. it's really so for let, let me let me just say something. So uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this course. And so Laura and I were talking, and you know, Laura's volunteered her time to do this course. And so what we want to offer is you know, we want to do a four hour course and we want to do it for two hours each. On this, she's going to actually get into more detail about how to do it. We're going to provide you with a workbook. The workbook would be, a, you know, you would actually follow along with us as we did it with you. We're only going to allow 50 people in the, the workshop. And you know, so that why Laura's not out public speaking right now, you know, we are going to do a charge on it, but we're going to keep the charge at a very minimal fee. 
Um, I just, I definitely want to be able to make sure that we take care of Laura. And so it's gonna, we're going to price it out at 125 and that will be for both courses. That will be for the, we're going to do them in two separate hours. We're going to do one course in two hours and then we're going to do the following course in two hours. Then at the end, you'll get your medical certificate and you'll also get your CEs. So we're going to really put it out there for this group because we, you know, it's, this is all new for all of us. And so we want to just do it with 50 people and we want to see how that works. So if you're interested, I know that a lot of your offices right now are going to be getting some of that um, PPP money back from the government. This is a great way to spend it. So if you're interested in getting your office team to actually go on and get certified in this medical billing, Laura is going to actually have that four hour course. Benco is going to sponsor it and we're going to walk you through everything that she went over today, only it's going to be a slower pace. Um, she's also going to allow you, if you just sign up, to actually share some of your cases in your office. And we're going to use those during our exercise so that we can actually take your particular cases and show you how to turn that around and get billed through medical. So that's going to be super exciting. And then also this afternoon, we have another um, webinar with uh, East Central and at e assist I'm sorry, e assist and we really want to make sure that you come on and watch that. It's going to really help you. We're, you know, we're all that money is going from our government. It's going to help. They're going to actually help you fill out the paperwork. So they're going to be walking you through, you know, what you should be filling out, what, you know, where the money's going. That's going to be amazing. And then after that, we also have um, Roy Shelburne. I know Laura and I both know Roy Shelburne really good. He's um, going to be on. We both love him, right? Now, Roy's basically going to be talking a little, a lot about dental. So, uh, Roy is more dental, Laura's more medical, um, but definitely Roy, come on. He's going to be on, on what's the date on that, Leah? Um, Wednesday, um, the 4th at 2 o'clock. Go ahead. Wednesday, the 4th at 2 o'clock Eastern time. Did I say it wrong? The 8th, K. Oh, the 8th. I'm sorry. Wednesday, <laughs> the 8th. Thanks, Leah. And then also, um, we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, let's see. We're going to have four. We have four others that we have scheduled. Here they are right here. So Leah will be actually putting out some uh, information on those courses. So and we're going to have a marketing guru. I can't wait. That's going to be an exciting announcement. Um, and then we're also going to have Tim Twig back and we're going to bring back another accountant to, to really help us figure out what's going on um, in today because it seems like every single day something's changing, right, Laura? So Chuck, I don't know if you're still on. Are you still on, Chuck? No, maybe not. So Laura, I just want to say thank you very, very much. You were amazing. Um, and again, your CEs will be mailed out to you within 30 days. So don't panic if you don't get it right away. And if you have any questions, please make sure that we, if, especially for Laura, we'll make sure that she gets them, but make sure that you address them to practice coaching at benco.com. I definitely want to say thank you to Leah. Um, who's been actually handling all of this from the backgrounds and then also to our two coaches. Yeah, our two coaches, um, Elizabeth and Donna, for all of their work. And I, I definitely our marketing team at Benco for getting this out as of yesterday. And it was basically 500 people signed up. So that was amazing. So again, if you want to sign up for Laura's courses, go on to the question and actually put your name in because we're going to offer it to you first. We're only going to hold 50 spots. So just type your name in. I would like a spot and we will make sure that you get in um, the spot. I think we're going to probably try to do it within the next two weeks. So please let us know by typing your name in the chat. Is it the question answer, right, Leah? Yes. Or you can simply email us at practicecoaching@bengo.com. And we'll make sure that your name gets signed up for that class. Anything else, Laura? Did I forget anything? No, it's great. I, I'm sorry to kind of rush through that, but I think you'll, I, I, it, it's going to be great. Don't miss it. I think that when we do the slower presentation and we really walk them through with the workbook, I think they're going to really love it. So guys, we really, we're here to help you. Let us know what we can do. Thank you so much for attending. Again, thank you, um, Benco, for sponsoring this and we'll see you in a couple of hours.